My name is Mayan Wong. I'm the Associate Artistic Producer of Under the Radar Festival. And we are at the Lowestor Lounge Hall for um, the festival. I would like to introduce um, Andy Horitz, who will be moderating um, this panel. And many of you should be familiar with him. He is the uh, Director of Public Programming at LMCC and the founder of Country Rock. Um, Andy wrote, and he's a really interesting thinker and a really great writer. And uh, he wrote a blog post on CultureBot uh, about three, a month ago, maybe? Some time ago, but recently. And uh, about visual art performance versus contemporary performance slash time-based art performance. And I remember I was reading it on my iPad or something on my way back from a NEA panel uh, from DC, <laughs> an Amtrak, and I just thought that because we were preparing for Under the Radar Festival, and um, I think it's important to have this conversation in the context of like so much work that we're seeing in the city and in the festival. And so I'm just very excited that all of you are here, and we have some great panelists, and, and I would like to introduce Andy Horowitz, who is sort of the brains behind this operation. And so welcome. Uh, we will, the thing will be about an hour and a half all together, and um, I hope you guys enjoy the discussion. And um, there's Andy. Hi. So welcome, welcome. Um, it's great to see so many of you here today. Uh, I want to take care of some housekeeping first. Um, I just first I want to thank Mei Yin um, for inviting uh, us to do this today. Uh, we had coffee and we brainstormed and we've been working very closely on this, so it's really exciting. Uh, I also want to shout out my culture bot colleague Jeremy Barker, who's right there. Uh, I. We were, Culture Body is eight years old in December. We've been covering contemporary performance, experimental theater, and dance. And I was doing it pretty much by myself until Jeremy showed up. So we've doubled our capacity. Um, and it's been really great. And then I, and then I have to thank Mark Russell, um, who, yeah, keep, round of applause for Mark, please. Um, just a little little backstory is that I, I used to work for Mark at PS122, and I kind of, uh, CultureBot wouldn't exist if he hadn't sort of given me permission to write a grant to NPN to do some support for that project. And um, it's, so it's, I'm really honored that to be a part of anything Mark's doing. Um, and you should be too. So um, really quickly, um, some of you may have clicked through to my post or Claire Bishop writing or some of the stuff. Um, before I introduce everybody, I just want to sort of frame it a little, that I'm kind of new to this conversation. Um, it's obviously been going on for 40 years or more. Um, and so I'm really excited to have, you know, artists and Rosalie and Philip here, and I'm looking around the room and there are people here who I'm sure, uh, you know, really have a strong grasp on this. So it's been very exciting for me to investigate. Um, you know, since Rosalie launched Performa in 2005, it really seems like, so this is coming from my place of recently discovering this, it seems like the visual arts world has really discovered or rediscovered performance in a really uh, big way. Um, and it's kind of interesting because Under the Radar was launched in 2005, and in the wake of Under the Radar, we've gotten um, PS 122's Coil, the American Realness Festival, and we've seen this incredible, like, fluorescence of really exciting contemporary performance in a theater context as well as this evolution of performance in a visual arts context, and yet they're on these parallel tracks that never meet. And, um, I, you know, and, and the more I sort of watch, you know, work like, you know, Temporary Distortion, or Roto Zaza, or Annie Dorson, or um, Richard Maxwell's ads, and the more I see it having the visual world, I'm like, there's, there's a conversation to be had here, there's similar ideas being investigated, but um, it's not happening. So, um, we're hoping to unpack some of that today, and um, with that, um, oh, and just a just a total plug for a show. Uh, <laughs> um, on January 19th, Gob Squad's Kitchen You Never Had It So Good is going to open. Uh, played here last year at Under the Radar, and it's going to be opening here at the public. And especially for people from a visual art background, um, what they do is they have sort of taken some of the ideas that Warhol put forth with his films, and. Um, specifically the film Kitchen, 
um, and they've totally reanimated it in this really exciting way that in, engages with many of the issues around authenticity and presence and spectatorship um, uh, and mediation. It's just, it's a really great piece, so I really encourage everyone to check it out uh, here. What? It's called Gobsquad's Kitchen. You never had it so good, and it opens here on January 19th. So um, let me, without further ado, introduce our panelists, or discussants, if you will. Um, to my immediate right is Rosalie Goldberg, the founding director and curator of Performa. Um, I'm not going to go into everyone's bios, because they're on the website, culturebot.org or .net, but not .com, because I can't buy it from them. <laughs> uh, but, um, you should all be familiar with Rosalie. Uh, Liz Magic Laser, who is an artist and who was recently in Performa with her piece, I Feel, I feel Your Pain. I Feel Your Pain. Uh, David Levine, also uh, a, a fantastic artist, uh, who is currently in PS 122's Coil. Your show is? Anger at the Movies. Anger at the Movies, and it is next week. Is this week? Right. It starts it. Monday, no. It's, there's, it I'm starts sorry. Tuesday. It's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and uh, kind of for free for an hour and a half on Monday. So. Okay, so that's a tip it's for free on Monday. Uh, and uh, at the uh, end, but certainly not least, Philip Bither, who is the Senior Curator of Performing Arts at the Walker Arts Center. Um, so I think what I'd like to do um, is we'll start over with Philip, because um, I know you know, the Walker Art Center is a multidisciplinary, you know, it's visual art, it's performance, it's all those things. So I thought um, we could just start about talking about, um, and you've been there for 15 years. Um, and so I thought we could start if we could talk a little bit about sort of how the performance program works with that and your relationship to visual art in that environment. Sure. Uh, well, the first thing I, I'll, I'll readily admit to that is that really my background and training was in the, in the contemporary performing arts. Um, so really when I went to the Walker, it was the first time I, I, I worked in a museum or, or arts center con construct. Um, so uh, when Liz said, it's funny that we don't have anyone here from the performing arts side, even though I'm at the Walker, I'm kind of, you know, uh, that person. Um, and I run a program that is uh, devoted to new forms and contemporary expression across a range of performing art dif disciplines. Uh, contemporary dance, experimental theater and performance, um, and a whole wide range of contemporary music forms. So that's really in the world that I live. And I think that ING at the end of perform is kind of critically important because it really is a 40 year history, 45 to 50 year history that the Walkers had involved in bringing contemporary performing arts and supporting new directions in these disciplines within a much bigger cultural setting um, in which we have a large collection and an acquisition program and a great exhibition program and a media program and film media. Um, but really my area is, is in following what's happening in dance and, and theatrical forms and in music. Um, that being said, being within a cons the, the, the sort of construction of a contemporary art center, um, we also very consciously try, and by mission specifically, to blur lines between disciplines, to look at hybrid forms, to really, to really sort of share ideas and influences across the disciplinary lines. It's not as always as easy as one might think it, it should be. There's all kinds of um, things that stand in one's way. Timelines being a large one of them is that exhibition planning often is three to five years in advance. Performance planning is a year and a half to a year or sometimes six months. And film programming is three to six months in advance. So um, uh, increasingly we are striving to find ways to have these conversations across departments. Uh, the, uh, but, but when I look back at the last 15 years, we really have actually supported a wide range of work and something that wasn't really reflected um, in Andy's essay is that uh, this work often in recent years has gone both directions. Um, my program embracing people who have really had some tra their primary training in visual art or collaborating with curators within the visual art side to make something special and new happen. 
Um, uh, Rosalie and I got a chance to work together on Shirin Nishat's first live performance piece 12 years ago. Uh, we worked on a project with Dan Graham called Don't Trust Anyone Over 30. We've supported artists even like right here this week. Rabia More was coming to the, our Out There Performance Festival next week. Um, Claude Wampler, many people who really live in the gray area between a contemporary performance coming out of visual art training and contemporary experimental theater. Um, we also uh, have, uh, and there's been a great openness at the Walker around um, identifying some artists who we think might either have interest and capability to transition into, into placing their work within gallery settings. So the Eco and Coma, the dance artists, work naked that just was, had a run here in New York, um, and their entire retrospective project found a home with us. We commissioned that work, we placed it in a gallery last fall, they ran the work for six hours a day for an entire month. Now these are artists who primarily are, are identified as dance artists, but we we've sort of framed them within, we felt it would, it would fit within the exhibition program. Um, Ralph Lemon, we, we offered a, a first time chance to have his work, he's a choreographer, American choreographer, but really in many ways thinks as a visual artist to place his work in a gallery setting. Um, we've sponsored some exhibitions that have, have looked at performance work um, a work, uh, an exhibition 14 years ago called Art Performs Life that focused on the work of Meredith Monk, Bill T. Jones, and Merce Cunningham. And in some ways, uh, Cunningham is, was sort of the, is kind of the patron saint of the program. He's one of the first artists that we made a commitment to. He was, he and the company were with us 15 or 18 times or something. There were multiple commissions and lots of different projects. And I think the spirit that Cunningham and Cage um, really live throughout their lives, it really informs and drives much of what we believe in and how we work at the Walker. Um, you know, I, I think a couple of things I, I might just, just say about where we are now and, and what, what we see happening um, in the future is that it, it's both an exciting and a sort of open question time as performance is embraced by the visual art world increasingly. Um, but I think in some ways, I guess, Andy, I would say a lot in your essay, I hope most of you have had a chance to read it, resonated. I, I was drawn, I found it compelling and important and timely. I also found that um, I didn't entirely agree with the black, slightly black and white um, nature of the conversation because I think there's a lot going on in these gray areas that, and, and it, actually the artists themselves tend not to be the ones who say, well I'm a visual artist making a performance or I'm an experimental theater artist. You know, there's a bit, bit more fluidity, fluidity between these worlds and these influences. Um, and I think that uh, there are many institutions outside of New York. I I'm part of a network called the Contemporary Arts Center Network. There's 10 different institutions that are multidisciplinary contemporary centers that have dedicated performance departments. And those are places that I think are really fertile grounds and are actively exploring this terrain. For whatever reason, and maybe it's because the cultural landscape is so, so visible and so large here in New York City, it's a particularly charged conversation. And I think those crossovers are a little bit more, more challenging, um, perhaps. Um, but Perform has done a tremendous amount around bringing these, these, this, this work to the surface. And I, I would say that um, Rosalie's done a lot in, 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 in bringing contemporary dance and um, some theatrical artists into that umbrella as well in exploring these questions. Um, the, the other thing that I think is, is, is at the root of the, of the sort of conversation is the fact that um, it's such a, a resource challenged moment, particularly I think in dance and theatrical forms, but in the States, but in New York in particular. So I think that makes the conversation that much more slightly heated because I think sometimes we see you know, a lot of attention or energy or press um, a attached to, um, to a particular uh, approach to performance art uh, and, that, and that people uh, may feel like, well, where's ours, you know? What, what, why not the same attention devoted o over here? Um, there is a bit of grass is always greener, I would say. Uh, you know, I think if you talk to contemporary visual artists that, you know, everyone has challenges around resources to a certain extent. Um, but I do feel that there's a great deal of education that's needed, and that's why the, I so wanted to be part of this conversation, from both directions. Uh, performing, the performing art world 
um, really could use a crash course in contemporary art history and artistic movements and new performance. And I would agree with Andy's comment around there's a lot of new performance art happening, perhaps being made by artists who might benefit from seeing a, a lot of the experimental theatrical and dance work that's happening um, simultaneously. So, you know, at the Walker, right now, for instance, we, we're forming a, a, a work group between curators. There's a great uh, collegial spirit between um, the curators in visual art and film and, and performing art. So I feel like it's a, it's a fortunate place to be where you can wander down the hall and say, what, what was that that you, just, that you guys just supported? Because we have, through the visual art program, supported Tino Segal and, and, um, and uh, Sharon Hayes and, you know, a number of artists who have worked performatively but have not been necessarily curated out of our program. People like Catherine Sullivan have created work through our visual art program but, uh, but with applications from performing arts to, to identify and help support her interest in using choreography in a new performance work. So there is this chance to kind of um, support one another and we have a full-fledged production department so we're able to, if an artist has an idea like Hegu Yang wanted to take a Marguerite Durat play it's the first time she'd done a theatrical work, and, and sort of experiment with, with using her lens to, to apply uh, a, an approach to this, to this work. And we were able to sort of collectively, as a team, visual artists and performing arts curators and staffs and production people support that effort. We did it as a, as a kind of private showing, you know, because it was an experiment, but it was, um, you know, really intriguing. And I think that's the other thing I would add to it. Sometimes we think, you know, one might say, well, what, why, why does this artist think, given their training or trajectory, they have the right, you know, to, to say, work in these other disciplines? And, and I think that's, that's really the wrong question. I think a lot of times artists from, from different backgrounds and different orientations who see the world through a different lens can, in fact, bring something really fresh and new to the forms that we're working in. Um, the last things I'd say is there's, there's, of course, been a long history of collaborative work between primarily performing artists and visual artists. Um, it's really on, on our mind at the moment at the Walker because we're starting to actually ac acquire the work, remnants of and set pieces and elements of um, performing artists' work that, that was left after the ephemeral <coughs> performance is over. So we just acquired for our collection the entire um, um, archive of sets, props, and costumes from the Cunningham Company now that they have ended their life. And that made perfect sense. Of course, it was kind of a no-brainer that it's Rauschenberg and Johns and Warhol and Nauman and things, you know. But we also are, per we purchased last year a work, you know, 16 millimeter earrings by Meredith Monk. We're in the process of purchasing a work by Ralph Lemon called Meditation that was part of his last performance piece. So I think there's a, Andy brought up the question of like, is there ways to leverage some of the the, the, the financial underpinnings that sometimes is able to support the visual art practice, but through the, the area of performing arts. And in some ways, that's not why we're doing this. We feel like these elements have an integrity and an absolute worth um, within a museum setting. But it may be also, um, from a kind of selfish, interested in maintaining the life and work of artists in the performing arts may also be another thread that helps support their future works as well through the acquisitions of some of these pieces. We also think that the acquisition of those works will, for the future, uh, tell, partly tell the story of what these ephemeral forms have, have what have happened with them. Otherwise, they're, they're lost. Um, and and uh, the, the last thing I might just say is that we're, we're devoting a lot more energy and time toward around interpretation and scholarship. You know, we've, we've developed not just several exhibitions uh, around performance, one last year or two years ago uh, looking at the work of Tricia Brown, but also catalogs and interpretive material and online um, uh, material and, and um, a lot on our new website that is really attempting to provide some writing and some, um, some scholarship and some interpretation around the work that, that is, for the most part, emanating out of experimental theater and contemporary dance forms. So. Great, thank you. Um, and we'll continue with the curator's uh, producer perspective. Um, <coughs> um, this, was a, this was an interesting year for Performa. Um, it was the third, uh, fourth, 25, you know, okay, sorry. Um, and it was felt bigger 
Um, and definitely in terms of the work that was being presented, um, we talked a little bit about this, there was definitely a more theatrical element to a number of the pieces. Elm Green and Drag Set um, actually had a proscenium <coughs> with actors. Um, Simon Fujiwara did his autobiographical solo performance. Um, and, you know, it seemed pretty conscious. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about sort of perform as a whole and sort of what was happening this year? Sure. So um, this year, indeed, our fourth biennial, and one of the themes, not the only theme, was to look into how do artists uh, look at the stage, the stage in a, in a very visual sense, and how do theater people do that? Um, mainly because I don't know any artists who go to theater. And uh, <laughs> it's a really interesting problem. They don't like to go there. They don't like to sit there. Uh, they, it's just total anathema. And um, so that was one problem. Uh, another, I tended to walk out of you know, a streetcar named Desire when I had to see the rape scene a third time and a fourth time. I, I get very, uh, I'm, I'm looking for something else, I realize. So um, we're talking here, uh, so I really wanted to actually, it, it was intentional, intended, to look at the way artists specifically think of theater. Um, and so a lot of the work came in response to that. And again, we take a very, very experimental approach to everything we do at Performa. We set ideas up for artists, they, they don't have to follow the program, they can take as much or as little as they want. And then it's, uh, we all head for the precipice together, which is opening night, and we see it the first time. Um, but audiences get very interesting, and some of the things that did, in fact, oh, just one thing to say, so it's on the record. Bravo for a blog that actually brings people together to have a big yeah. conversation. Um, if anyone's worried about what criticism on blogs do, this is what they can do in the most positive way. Um, so I wanted to do a little experiment, if you don't mind just working with me. And I'm going to stand up so I can see you all. Um, just talk about audiences. Um, anyone here from finances, will you please stand up? <laughs> okay, 1%. You're not here. Um, anyone from a literary background? I mean, you know, let's say your undergraduate degree, yes. Can you stay, remain standing? Uh, <coughs> Shelly, you might want to help me count. Can you just come here and count? So we've got three people, four people. How many people do we have from literature? Okay, um, okay, visual arts, strict visual arts, somebody coming out of art history or visual art. And I should say, not including my performer crowd, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, okay, how many do we have from visual arts? Seven. Seven? What if you're both? And please, uh, okay, and David's on the fence. It's okay, you, one foot, one, is, we're going to talk about that, because I think there's two that one foot. up, right brain, left brain. Those with the left brain, the art world, they like to see the big picture. They like to touch and feel things. Remember making things, artists? Uh, so now you may sit down so I don't come and actually stand and say. Um, but so the conclusion I come to, one is we've got evidence here today that you're all here today, not because anyone said to the art world, don't come, but because Mark's Under the Radar Festival just give me the byline again. It's described as new theater from around the world. I don't think you're using this week. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I looked at it on the, um, it's something like that. Tracking new theater from around the world. Say that again? Tracking new theater from around the world. So because of that, everyone from the theater world comes here. And uh, where's the art crowd? 
I went to Sontag the other night, I looked around, I didn't know a soul. I went to Big Art Group, remember, it's got the word art in it. I looked around, I saw one person from Performer with me, sitting there, two people sitting next to me, because we thought we'd try to be sure to see everything. No, and David, no, was we there, David? No, you weren't there. No one from the art world. So I'm talking here too about many, many different audiences, but going back to what I really find intriguing is that these different brains. Now, if I were to peel back some of your brains, you know, the left hand brain here, left brain and the right brain, art world, theater world, they're different brains. Um, I, I grilled uh, Andy the other day, so what's your background, Andy? He says, oh, classical theater. I said, tell me what's classical theater. Chekhov, Ibsen, Shakespeare, sort of Brecht, right? He got up to there. Language, he starts with language. You grew up an art world person. What's your background? No way. Terry, are you trying to say something? No. Oh, sorry. I did leave out dance and. I... No, no, no. I'm just curling my hair. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they say with the, your auctioning? You just gave away your house, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, but you did remind me that we could be talking about dance, but I, I just thought we might be going too far afield. There are probably three dancers here today, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, five. Yay, some more. Okay. <laughs> but so I, I'm, I'm trying to really conjure up some of these ideas. So the art world crowd do not start with language. Uh, we, we, language is nowhere in. You know the thing the dumb artists don't talk to them, just let them make or do. That was the 50s. You know this idea that artists make, they don't say, they don't speak about that, what they do. People in theatre start with a very different place. They start with a love of words. Basically, they start with loving words. They start with loving to articulate words. You see how I'm struggling here to, to get my voice out. I'm not a trained speaker. I, not, you know, I tend to mumble and very, you know, I don't project, but I'm working on it. Um, so, and and in theater, what happens too is that, you know, let's take the basics. And this is again what was coming out of this looking into artists looking at theater. In theater, you have uh, a write, a playwright. Then you have a director. Then you have, well, probably a producer if you're lucky. Then you have uh, a set designer. Then you have a costume designer. Then you have a lighting designer, and on and on and on. If you go backstage, you've got this long list of collaborators. In the art world, you tend to have this one vision, this one visionary, this one person, even if they do eventually hire somebody to do the film or the, the lighting, the costume, it's still theirs to, to decide. They're, they're the one driving the Porsche. Everybody else has to get in the back seat. That, that artist will make all those decisions. And of course, some directors will be that dictatorial, but by then they've already, they're working with a lot of other people's material by the time they come out and act as directors. So these are the questions that I've been looking at in relation to this area called performance art, visual art performance, or even in the art world. And that was a lot of the separation that was coming up in the in the blog was that, you know, the art world uh, needs to pay attention. You know, you won't get the artists to talk to the theater people and vice versa. They don't have a common language. They really don't. I think if you put them in front of a theater, they first of all, they wouldn't sit, sit through it. You can't tie them down to sit through it. So these are some of the questions that I find very, very interesting about these different brains, a different starting point. So what do I do at Performer? Um, and maybe I should say, what if, I, some of you probably know my book on the history of performance art, which yeah. first wrote in 1979. And what I think about all the time, all the time, all the time, are those edges. What goes on here between dance and art, between film and art, between theater and art, between politics and art, between, and on and on. And maybe my entire sort of intrigue for this area that I spent, you know, the last four decades writing about is because I'm always looking at how those edges come together. And maybe if I am forced in the corner with everyone throwing things at me to define what performance art is, I would say it's actually where all those things hit, those edges where they hit. That it's, it's not one defined thing, oh, this is performance art. No, it was, you know, artists were doing, Leonardo da Vinci did performances in, in 1460. Uh, you know, Bernini did performances in, and, you know, in, in the 17, mid 1700s. Uh, on and on and on. Artists have always done live performances performance by some other name, it might be called a pageant, it might be called the fireworks, but artists have always done performance. And they're not doing it particularly looking over their shoulder at what the theater people are doing, they're doing it in relation to ideas that are going on in the art world. So I've always seen people can point and say, oh, she's dealing with the art world, and that was the slightly naive thing about some of the, the, the culture bodies, oh, you know, the art world has money, 
a few artists have money. There's not that much more money rolling around the art world that, you know, than any of these other worlds. There are a couple of high earning artists, so the rest struggle like everybody else. Um, so this is what Performer does. And from the beginning, why I started Performer, the, the biennial, was because I felt that this, all these areas, there's, there's a very, very rich history. There's a rich history leading back, and I decided to, you know, in, as my book to start with the 1900s, with futurism, where the theater people were, were talking to the artists, with Russian constructivism. Maya Hall was talking to the constructivists and making an unbelievable theater slash dance slash uh, visual art slash, you know, we don't know what to call it because they were drawing on all these different disciplines. Uh, moving to the 20s and in, in Paris, uh, we have Picabia with uh, Duchamp, with the, the, the Swedish Ballet, with um, Man Ray, with uh, René Clair, filmmaker, all coming together. So if you want, my own fascination has been from looking at 100 years, let's say, of performance, where actually it is always about those collaborations. So this is something I think about all the time, is those collaborations. Um, so that was, that, that's a little bit to talk about. Starting the former was to say this area needs a special, needs thinking in a way that we're not getting when we go just to a museum or when we go just to a, a performing arts, you know, these separate schools. We need something that brings us, as you're doing today, all together to start to understand how these different histories happen. And, you know, sorry to say, my own obligation in life, I feel sometimes like I'm a Chinese, you know, juggler going like this and keeping 14 plates in the air, and one is called theater, dance, film, you know, on and on, graphic design, architecture, sculpture, because it is our job to see what's going on in all those disciplines and find how they connect. And that, of course, includes music and anyone else I might have left out. Um, so that was the starting point for performer, to make this history, above all, it's, it's a real histori history, it's a hugely intellectual endeavor to talk about history, how important history is for us, how looking back in those earlier periods, they were more radical than anything we're doing today, and maybe history is my inspiration, saying, come on, let's have courage to look at things in a very, very new way. And the next point was, I wanted to provoke the future by commissioning new work. And that was very, very important to us because I felt what I was seeing out there, if I saw one more monologue, <laughs> I was going to take off my shoe like I did in Iraq and throw it. You know, it's like, no more monologues, please. Uh, please don't keep redoing the 70s. Please, start, you know, no more bloodletting and, you know, all these really <laughs> difficult pieces about, I don't know, you know, all that stuff. Uh, I wanted to think maybe by supporting young new artists by proposing to them, even maybe someone who hasn't done performance before, what would you do? How would you treat time? What happens? Maybe we could actually generate a new generation, generate a new way of thinking of what, the, what all these things could be and make them very, very public and bring people together around that. So that's the big mission. Uh, just one other question, just since I'm such a historian, I had to answer all your questions. You did mention in the email you sent me, like for example, this year, you even had Reggie Watts, and he's a comedy act, and he's, you know, and he's been in Under the Radar. Why are you dealing with comedy? Once again, um, take you back in history. Uh, firstly, if I close my eyes, sometimes I'm watching Reggie Watts, I think I'm hearing Eric Bogosi. Um, the 70s was, was riddled with fabulous artists making live performance and comedy. Mike Smith, Doug Skinner, um, Stuart Sherman, uh, Andy Kaufman. Pat Lesko. Uh, the 70s it was fabulous. Ralston Farina, people who you know, are not with us anymore. Um, just endlessly going to these events that were funny, that were clever. And they're always, yes, they're very much about the art world. Uh, because worlds, they, the people tend to talk about their own worlds, but they were also looking outside. So history is what guides this question. Are we going to try to keep all these doorways open? Absolutely. Um, but there's a lot to explain when there's this question of how come you're only handling the art world? Um, because I feel that we're actually always trying to keep our eyes open and you know keep these plates in the air. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that brought up a lot. Um, and I would and and um, I'm I, I want to actually turn this over to the artists because they're the ones actually making the work and can discuss this from the inside, what they're dealing with. I just want to uh, 
throw out a couple of things that Rosalie brought up, um, which I think is really interesting, which is that actually much of the work that's happening, that's exciting in theater, is not necessarily text-based and not playwright-driven. Um, and that model um, is not necessarily the prevalent model in, in, in performance making right now. So I think um, I would like to, the artists maybe to address some of the thoughts about sort of are they left-brain? I mean, is that relevant to your process? Um, just really quick. And um, the other thing is that I think, so I guess one of the things that came up for me and that prompted me to write the article was about craft and practice and authenticity versus mimesis. Um, in that I think the idea of bringing artists different imaginations together or, or to create is great, but if one per, if, if a subset of artists has a particular skill set that enables them to engage with a certain set of issues around presence and performativity and uh, spectatorship and um, spends a lot of time in that realm, is it unreasonable to uh, expect there to be a dialogue between new people exploring that so that they can actually build a skill set and, um, and implement their vision more um, aptly. So um, I'm just throwing that out there, but I guess we'll start, but what I'd like to do is to sort of have David and Liz, uh, maybe, um, David, do you want to start? Sure. Just sort of talk a little bit about your work and sort of some of the ideas that um, you're engaging with. Because you got, because you're kind of like, you were started in theater and then moved into visual art? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I could probably try to address some of the things Rosalie brought up also. Um, I started out as a theater director uh, who didn't enjoy going to the theater at all, but really liked, um, the, the, but really sort of liked the process of rehearsal, and I liked the sort of intense amount of rigor and skill that went into really conventional theater. I mean, all, all kinds of theater, but, but what I was really fascinated by all the time was actually the mimesis and just how much work it took and how much intense, very classical analysis of a script it took to actually get to the point where it looked like you weren't acting and the whole sort of mania of method acting. And the sort of, because obviously if you, if you take it far enough, you've turned into another person completely and nobody, nobody will ever know that you're acting. So it's kind of, and in a weird way, it struck me, I mean, it always kind of struck me when I was working. I was, I mean, I was doing a bunch of downtown stuff. I was also doing stuff off-Broadway and, you know, realistic kind of stuff. But it, um, but I was mainly going to museums and I was mainly going to galleries and I, I grew up in a, I grew up in a household that was kind of saturated with, with sort of 60s and 70s kind of art. And I really thought of, I thought that's what I was doing, and I thought that's what was going on, and I, I sort of came to realize very quickly that that's not what's going on uh, in theater, and that actually the sort of parameters and the idea of artistic authorship and some of the stuff that Rosalie's talking about isn't necessarily feasible for a variety of reasons, but I also wound up realizing that what really fascinated me a lot about theater and the techniques that it employs were, especially with regards to to method acting, which nobody really does anymore, but all sort of conservatory training is based is based on it, was that it you know in its seventies high parody kind of version, it really approached the condition of duration of endurance art or of body art, um, and all the sort of legendary stories of actors kind of losing thirty pounds and you know like swallowing mayonnaise to learn how to vomit and all this kind of stuff. It was really I mean if if you'd recontextualized it, it would be something else. It, it was it was in a sense that simple. So I liked everything. I liked everything about theater except going. And <laughs> I liked everything about theater except the rituals involved. But so I just started thinking a lot about. So this is a, this is a long answer for it. But one, but one but one quick thing to say about Rosie is I don't think it was really about. For me, it was never about language. It was actually about form. Like I wasn't, and this is where I mean like the misapprehension. I think the reason I never. I, People get into theater for a lot of reasons. Playwrights get into theater because they love language. Uh, actors, some actors get into theater because they love language, some don't. Uh, I think directors, some directors get into it because they love language. I got into it because I love being able to sculpt time and space, but again, a, con a concession to Rosalie's point, at a certain point I couldn't do what I wanted to do in mainstream theater. It just became kind of impossible because of production pressures and things like that. So I went to Berlin. Um, 
to start a program there, and I went to this theater called the Volksbühne, uh, which is kind of the only theater I've ever enjoyed going to in my entire life. And it partially because it's just, you don't feel like you're walking to the theater. There's, I mean, the tickets are cheap. There's a Turkish guy in the lobby selling sandwiches. They rarely turn on the lights, turn off the lights. They've got, you know, they had Schlingensief and Jonathan Mise. They were trying to get Paul McCarthy to design sets for them for a while. And it was just incredibly loose. I mean, the whole thing was very, and I was watching this and I was like, and I had the same reaction that a lot of theater people do when they go over to, for that, <laughs> and which was which is which was kind of like, oh man, you know, why are we doing more of that radical shit in New York? Da, 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 da. And the more I thought about it, and this is where I think we really we really deviate is, I, it's what it really is a it's a question of institutional context, and it's a question of institutional financing structures, and it's a question of and it's a question of a million protocols, and y'all y'all are gonna kill. In, in my experience, and this is someone who doesn't like going to theater, um, you know, like. 70% of your experience going to theater is determined by the rituals involved in going to theater. There's very minor degrees of variation in terms of what's on stage. Like you can put all the video you want or whatever, but pretty much 70% of it is always the same thing. You go, you show up on time, you sit down or you stand, but you're really sitting, or you know, there's people in the audience or they're not, but it always feels very much to me the same. So what I wanted, to, but that's also because of, you know, like Philip was saying, you know, you've got, You've got these crazy kind of structures that dictate when, you know, exhibitions are planned five years in advance, right? You know, and, and theaters planned a year in advance, but theaters planned a year in advance, but six months, you know, six months, well, not in America, but like six weeks are allotted for rehearsal. Whereas, you know, whereas there's no time for rehearsal in, generally, in a performance art event, you know, and so part of it is, as you said, a kind of emphasis on the authentic as opposed to the rehearsed, which also kind of interested me, but part of it is just production pressures. I mean, like, like, like art, art curating, art institutions, art, you know, performance art curating are really set up to allow for, like fiscally, spatially, to allow for the kind of prep that goes into a theater thing. So the ways in which, the ways in which institutional context determines the content start getting really fascinating to me. And then the, the third part of this was that I realized that theater, theater is, there's no, there's a really rich language in, in, in contemporary art for discussing the conditions of its own production for discussing art making. And it's viable as art. There's no such context for theater. Like occasionally someone like Mike Daisy will like be able to talk about how theater gets made in a theatrical context. But for the most part, we have no, there's no tradition of institutional critique at all. And there's no space for it. There's no, I mean, one thing about visual arts, it's incredibly flexible in terms of like how it can put things up, where it can put things up. It's, it's voracious that way. Theater has a much more cumbersome setup, like institutionally, financially, spatially, and it makes it much harder to pose these questions in a way that is not external to the thing itself. So I started, I started really thinking about what I, the kind of work I wanted to make, there was room for it in a visual arts context, and there was room for the formal questions I wanted to ask in a visual art context, but there wasn't room for it in a theatrical context, and then I started wanting to play these things off against each other in, whatever ways I could. So what would happen if you floated straight theater under the formal conditions of uh, visual arts? So the first kind of project I did was at um, Gavin Brown's Passerby, where I blocked two, two actors into a fake minimalist sculpture and had them do a Broadway, Broadway plays on a loop all day <laughs> um, for a week. And you couldn't see them. You could only hear them. And you, know, you just walked in, and there was this big, kind of terrible, you know, like damn Grammy kind of thing just floating there. But you heard this drama, there was just no way to focus on it. So ways of kind of allegorizing the split that you were talking about, but also ways of saying, ways of saying, you know, I mean, I, I you know, I, there's also the other thing that happens with theater, and Philip mentioned this, there's a huge, when, when performance art started ha calling itself performance art, when performance started popping up in the 60s, there was a huge stress on, on the artists to differentiate themselves from theater. And you've got all these statements about the like Capra and Burden. You think like, it's not theater then, it's not theater because it's really happening, you know? Or, you know, I, I, got an, I got an argument one time with the Brahma Vichar, she was like, why don't you put yourself in your pieces? And I was like, well, because it's, it's fake. I mean, it's like, it's like I'm not, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm suffering for people, I'm not really suffering. Like, I mean, the, the promise of authenticity isn't, you know, I mean, it's not, and she's like, no, 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 you just forget about it. You just forget they're there after long enough. I'm like, yeah, but you're still not really, 
So I wanted to be like, okay, I'm going to take straight mimesis, which you know, straight, the kind of theater that a, that a visual that a visual arts performance context just loathes. You know, like weeks of rehearsal, all this kind of stuff. And then I'm just going to loop it, and I'm going to loop it, and I'm going to get rid of the theater, and I'm going to get rid of all the rituals that make it theater. I'm going to get rid of the ticket purchase. I'm going to do it during the day. I'm going to do it in the gallery. I'm gonna, the, you know, I'm not you're, I'm not going to have staging, but it's still going to be realism. But and it's still going to be a conventional narrative, which I love and which I really miss in visual arts performances. You know, this kind of is is straight soap opery kind of narrative, which is always somehow in quotes, um, which is something we can talk about. But and just see, you know, so basically create a situation where the audiences, you'd have this object that would sit between the two disciplines, and it would satisfy the minimum requirements of both disciplines. But you'd have to, depending on where you came from, you'd own it as one or as the other, so you're like, you don't like you don't like narrative, but this is you know this is running on an endless loop. This is sculptural, or you know oh you don't you know you want to sit down and buy take you you want to see a drama, and you're seeing you're seeing a straight drama, but and so and also ways that you can get the institutions to either trip each other up or to work together. You know if you could get a piece that was co-commissioned by a theater and you know like 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 I did a piece at Mass Mocha, but and then and there was co-commissioned by. Mass Mocha's performance department and uh, Visual Arts Commission in Toronto. And so what you could do, because that would seem to be the real achievement in a way. And that, you know, when you talk about Under the Radar and Performa, and, and Rosalie's totally right. I mean, we, we've all been on this panel together at various points. And it's either, it's either all, only art people if it's in a gallery or in a museum, or it's only theater people if it's here. But if you could, if you could actually force two institutions to actually work together, that would be the real artistic achievement. The content is almost in, immaterial, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, the content is a pretext for, for that kind of fusion. Mm -hmm. so. I think, um, great, thank you. Yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 it's good, we're good. Um, no, I, I mean, I think that that's exactly, um, I mean, hopefully this is a first step uh, in sort of an ongoing process, because I do think that, um, you know, you address like, you know, theater, like, I think one of the things that performance, performing arts-based artists could really uh, benefit from learning from the visual art world is creating context for self-critique and actually building, I mean, visual arts has this wonderful uh, wellspring of discourse uh, and, and, and theory, and we don't have that as much in the performing arts, or at least it's not as integrated into the experience of the performing arts, I think, and it's also something we don't do a very good job of communicating out to the to the world. Why would you want to come and have this other experience, or why is it not? You know, how do you get people to learn that you know a performative experience isn't necessarily you know Strasbourgian or whatever. Um, anyway, so um, enough of my yakking. Liz, please, you're you're definitely in the visual art world, starting. And then, but your work is very performative, and this last piece I saw at the SVA Theater was really very, you know, kind of like environmental theater in a way. So, you want to talk about, you know, your process and how you sure. come to what you do? Sure. Um, I, my history with performance is fairly familial, actually, because my, um, my mother is a choreographer. And I grew up in a in a rehearsal space, so I had seen you know, uh, um, in a loft without where the walls don't go up all the way. I had improvisation going on. I don't know, three or four days a week, a very um, uh, visceral um, process that incorporated um, a variety of um, of methods from from dance and theater and. Um, and um, primal therapy. So uh, my mom's name, uh, Wendy Osserman, so we don't have the same last name. But um, so I, I grew up going to see dance and theater. Um, and so maybe I'm, I, I do, I am the one artist, you know, then who does enjoy <laughs> going to theater. And I was thinking, that as, as that issue came up, I was thinking about it, um, how even when I, Go to see a piece of, I probably, and I don't go all the time, but I, maybe on average, uh, twice a month, I go to see theater or dance the last few years, and it comes in different spurts where I'll go every week, and then I don't go for a month. But um, I think that maybe I appreciate it even when I think something isn't fully successful. Um, I 
appreciate the, the, the level of commitment, which I more often feel is lacking when I, when I go around to Chelsea sometimes I have this demoralized feeling and I almost never have that when I go to see a piece of live performance because <coughs> I, can, I can feel the level of um, energy investment and commitment that, that went into doing that and so there's almost always something for me to chew on. Um, but so uh, that said, I, I was a photographer for, so, for some years and I would photograph my mom's dance company and then I would uh, some of her dancers became choreographers like Asher Barton and Ophelia Lorette de Molia. And uh, we would, I would do their, pho their photography for um, posters, flyers, press, and they would participate in my projects. So this issue, uh, even though I was very uh, situated, oriented towards photography, it was directorial photography and um, I was uh, very engaged in this issue of how to translate performance through the camera. And so when my, this transition happened for, uh, for me where I started to work with, at first it was performance-based video and then into, it transitioned into live performance, um, I would always incorporate the role of, um, of the camera. The videotaping or the photographing became um, an active element or participate, uh, participant um, in, in many of the projects I've developed. Um, and this also brings me to the um, subject of a lot of my work has become how the media affects us and how the, um, how the mediation of, of the camera can be reoriented or redirected in some way. Um, and that's largely because I'm looking at how ideology is being insinuated um, into us, into our psyches, through um, vi the visual culture, uh, through uh, film and television. Um, but so then what also happened for me um, is that a theater director asked me to collaborate with him. I guess it was 2007, and we were both um, at grad school at Columbia, but there was no institutional. This is, I think, you brought up a really fantastic point, David, about um, the need for um, contextual collaboration, institutional collaboration, because it's happening I, amongst um, artists, practitioners in the field, uh, in both fields, um, that kind of collaboration is happening all the time, but audiences aren't necessarily being cross-bred and contexts aren't necessarily being um, shared. So, uh, so a theater director named James Dacre asked me to, um, he's British, um, and he asked me to um, collaborate on um, making video and photographs that became the environment for a production he was doing at Here Art Center. And so I worked with all the actors in that production, and one, uh, one woman, um, Annika Boras, I uh, really got along well with, and we kept working together after that. Then I was in, um, actually in a choreographer, Corey Kresge's dance piece, and I met another actor in that, um, in doing that, and all of these elements cross-wired, um, and, I, and I made this gradual turn towards working with theater as material. Um, and most often, in your questions about context, uh, at first I misunderstood it, because um, I'm thinking about context quite a bit in a more immediate sense with bringing theater um, in quotes into other contexts like the bank or Times Square. And um, that's often um, the um, groundwork or parameters that, um, that I set up that, that, that um, becomes the genesis of a project is a really a friction between the activity of theater and the, and the space that it's in. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so. I think that's pretty much. Okay. Um, well, I have a question though. Because um, I, um, do you document your work? Yes, but the documentation is part of the project. So, for instance, in the piece that you, uh, that you saw, um, uh, that I worked on with Rosalie for Performa, um, 
be performed the live production of a film. So in that case, that, that was um, a situation where for a while I felt like this is the time I'm going to have to confront the black box where I, um, I've been going to the black box my whole life, <laughs> but it's maybe um, has become somewhat of a, uh, a, a specter of, <laughs> of fear for me because it seems like lack of context because it, it, it represents this illusory uh, um, space where um, uh, where the I don't know the total spectacle happens and it, and so the, uh, that was interesting to, to to think about the way that Claire Bishop spells out that um, dichotomy um, between the white the white cube where everything is visible but it's really just a myth you know, she says it quite well it's it's, um, it's a myth it's a performance of the reality effect. There is no, we're already operating under these conditions, so I think she ends with a great conclusion where it's time to get over uh, this obsession with reality effect. But back to your question, um, uh, for the Performa piece, um, I developed a script that uh, was working off of uh, dozens of interviews with politicians and also texts from press conferences and some um, these dialogues were uh, montaged and adapted um, into a number of vignettes that took on um, the character of ro um, romantic banter or marital spat. And, um, and so these scenes played out, uh, the setting was people on dates at the movies. And so these, um, this took place um, amongst the audience and I was also working with um, cinematographers who were filming uh, the scene as it unfolded, so it produced a live film on, on the um, screen of the cinema, and it was a uh, you know, red chairs, typical pop movie theater. And, um, and so in that case, we were literally performing the live production of the film, and so that was, I edited it as it um, unfolded. I was talking to the to the camera, um, to the cinematographers, and um, through an earpiece as it as it unfolded. And I and I realized later, actually, in a moment. Uh, so so basically, the object is the film we produced there. So it's not really something separate. Mm -hmm. It's not something I, I separate out okay. from the rest of the process. If that if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, um. Okay, great. Um, we're at two o'clock, and um, just you know, because I'm about time. It's a time-based performance. For all of you. <laughs> um, but I'm looking around, and I'm like, there are just so many amazing uh, artists and curators uh, here in the room. Um, so, unless anybody minds, I'd really like to open it up at this point and invite um, questions or comments or, so we can, I mean, there's a lot that we didn't, uh, we, we brought a lot to the table in terms of everyone's experience and what their professional practice is. We haven't really started to unpack some of the issues around, we've sort of opened up a little, a few avenues here and there about um, authenticity, practice, context, uh, you know, I think, it, the right brain, left brain thing would be a very interesting thing to unpack and sort of artistic process. So um, I'd really like to open it up. I know, um, I don't want to call anybody out, but, but I know there are some really, really uh, smart people in the room. Uh, you're all smart people. Some people I actually, I know them. So um, maybe we can, does anyone have anything to share? Questions, thoughts? I can, I can lead the conversation. Can I ask a question? Yeah. What what do you I mean what do you think of what do you think of artists like like Liam Gillick or Alex Singh? I mean are people who are just extremely text and language based. Mm -hmm. Like are they are they are they what is one I mean no, I um, mean would you invite them to do a oh, performance absolutely. or like Yeah, the text part is obviously I mean in fact that came up a lot. Right. He said mentioned two artists, Alex Singh and Liam Gillick, who both work with a lot of text. And in fact, the starting point, and that was another aspect of performer, was 
looking at a lot of use of text in different ways. So we had a newspaper. I mean, there were a lot of other elements that we were looking for where text was present. Um, and in fact, we've worked with both of them and we'll continue to work with both of them. So but you wouldn't call them theater artists? Just no. Primarily. no but they don't seem like the most tactile art. I mean, the, I mean your, your distinction about artists, the artists go for material first, I mean, especially with contemporary conceptual work. That right. I mean, you know, like any of those, uh, trying to create these two separate areas, um, I think people also take from a lot of those parts, like Liz describes, or like you do, I say, I, I see people like with one foot on one side, or intentionally crossing and cross-fertilizing, but where you choose to put that, where you choose primarily to work, who, who you're talking to, I think it's very interesting that it's not just context, it almost makes it too, you know, like, oh, I made this decision for context. I think the art world, the art, this is one other thing to add that I believe in. I really feel that the art world is a very permissive sociological mm -hmm. subset, maybe the most permissive. In fact, it not only expects, it insists that you break rules. It insists that you don't do something that was done like that last week. You know? And it's not just a fascination for the new. It is the nature of the artist to be in this constantly ruminating about the present and about what culture means in that as it affects my skin. You know, it's, it's a very personal take on society and culture as it is moving. So there's something that the art world, and maybe that's the one umbrella that I do call this thing, the performance art world, is where people come from all those different disciplines to do their most inventive work. And just going back to art historically, I mean history again, Philip Glass, Trisha Brown, Lucinda Childs, these people came to the art world. Their first 20 years was in the art world getting their recognition. They then, like prodigals, go back, and now you can believe it, you know, you better believe Phil Glass is in music history, but he wasn't for 20 years. You know, Juilliard was not looking at him. Um, Trisha Brown, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those people come in to gravitate to the art world from these different disciplines. You know, Eric Bogosian recognizing that he can do performance, although he's coming totally out of his theater. But recognizing you don't need permission, you don't need a theater, you don't need a director, you can just set up in any room and say, hey guys, I'm a theater artist, but you know what? I'm going to do it. So the art world provides not only this very interesting conversation, but a, a, a radical place to operate. And that's, that I don't, I, I don't think you get that in theater, you don't get that in architecture. You, you just don't get it because of the nature of it. It's hard to get a lot of theater people. Who's, who's, you know, which part of the theater are you talking about? The artist is still a singular individual in a very strange way. And just one more thing I wanted to throw in there, talking about these div many, many divisions. And I'm not you know, one or the other. I'm just saying that so many slithers of different audiences that I look at every day, I'm amazed at all these different audiences. You go to opera and you sit there and say, people are having a ball. I don't get it. But they, they're <laughs> having a great time and they're, you know, but they, would they come here? They think they're not. I mean, there's certain things I look at performer programs like, no, 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 don't go there. You'd be freaking. Go there. That's okay. You'll manage there. You know. <laughs> But also, by the way, and I noticed that today, there's, or well, yesterday morning, two major articles by Ben Brantley. He got out to the Gob Squad, he got out to the Japanese this weekend, could not get him to see Performer, even though we had theater, even though we had two famous, you know, Shakespearean actors and the Elmering Drugs, drugs at these, Joseph Fiennes and Charles Edwards, could not get a theater person, reviewer, critic, to come and see that work, even to talk about what is this argument. So that's another thing we, next week when you have your critics talk. No. Yeah. Um, the fact that critics won't cross, the, the editors won't let them cross right. the, the line. Yeah. You know, I sort of even asked, you know, well, how do we get Brantley? I know some, you know, I know, how do we get him to come and see Simon from Juara? I want this conversation. You can't do it. Yeah, well, they will send big, the art people in. Yeah. I mean, it's a big problem even in theater. If Ben Brantley and Trump, are they here? Uh, you know, uh, you know, they don't necessarily. Uh, I mean, dance and theater don't cross either. There's there's a handful of critics who can kind of go back and forth, even among performing arts. Um, and you know, I'm thinking. I don't know if anyone last year saw Brian Rogers' Selected Memory out of the Chocolate Factory, which was a dance piece that was essentially a video installation with one embodied actor dancer on stage running everything from a moat moving really slowly, and it's like that would have been an awesome piece for a visual arts writer to come and examine, um, or, a, or a few 
theater person, but Alistair McCauley surprisingly did a really thoughtful piece around it. Um, but the writing around all of this stuff is really complicated and really problematic, I, I agree. Um, one thing that I sort of want to address, that, because in my sort of arc, I've worked with not so many visual artists, that's, that's new for me, but I have worked with you know, dancers and theater artists, I know you've worked with them as well, and I guess that I, I'm a little resistant to the idea that only sort of, or maybe that's not what you're saying. I agree that there's, a, my experience has been the visual art world is more permissive, but, I, but I'm, I resist the characterization that it's only visual artists that have this sense of exploration and being constantly seeking the new and constantly engaging with contemporary dialogues. I know most of the artists in the dance world and in the theater world that I enjoy and I admire are constantly <laughs> oh, I, I, constantly. I did not mean it that way, but okay. it was, I'm right. rather saying that they, those really doing that most difficult work in that field will find their way into the artwork. Uh, but like, that's, like but that's exactly what I was saying. I thought that you were saying that the context is permissive. Yes. And the, that the context of the art world uh, is a bit more permissive where anyone, there's some uh, sense that, that, um, that people oriented towards other fields are allowed to, but that's to hop in. And so, yeah, it's, it's interesting because one of the other questions that you asked in your email that I didn't get to answer was if, that, if I would ever consider working in a theater context. And it recently came up a few months ago where a playwright um, named Peter Morris approached me if I would consider. And I had never thought of it. And, and um, I had no idea if it'll work out or not, but I decided that I would want um, to try it. But the issue was exactly this. How is it legitimate for me to perform as director in that in that case? And I don't know, maybe I'm I'm also looking a lot these days at Irving Goffman, a sociologist who uses mm -hmm. theater as his. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at that and he talks a lot about this issue of what's perceived as a legitimate performance or an illegitimate performance. And it's again this issue of um, whether it's accepted in that field, you know, would it, would it be uh, perceived as what, what she thinks she's doing acting as a theater right, but director? But it goes, it, goes right. it goes in both, I mean, that also, the possessiveness, I mean, the sort of, I mean, there, there's, on the, on the one hand, I mean, it's, it's totally true, and this is sort of what I meant by 70% of, you know, theater, I mean, if you, if you are restless within the formal constraints of your field, you go to visual arts, because, <laughs> Because it's because it's you know I mean I think it's partially a financial question because it's right. because it's so commodity based and it's constantly looking for new markets. Um, I mean and I say that in a good way, but there's room for you, right? I mean if you if you're frustrated with the formal constraints of your field, you can carve out you can carve out space there and do stuff in there. Just this one but, misconception. Yvonne Rain did not go to Judson Church and become because it was money. No, no, no. I don't mean that kind of money. No, no. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying it's because we can make money. I'm, no, saying, no, I'm, I'm saying, saying this idea that the hour provides a space because it's no, 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 commodity-based. No, no, my point. Take it back. <laughs> my point. My point is that the art, the art context, is in a fundamental way based on and funded by. I mean, I don't mean individual performance artists, especially not performance art, but funded by sales. And I think, but I think one one reason why it's such a welcoming place is because like capitalism generally is constantly in some, not, not consciously in terms of individual actors, but it's constantly looking to open up new markets. It's constantly looking to colonize new things. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's just I'm trying to understand why it is that a frustrated artist will not necessarily go into theater, but a frustrated theater artist, you know, might, or a frustrated musician or choreographer will find a home in dance because it's always willing, the art context is always willing to like take a look or try new things or let you find a new way of creating of creating work, and I think one one thing that performing arts, non-visual performing arts, struggles against is that we don't really ask these kind of formal. I mean, you can you can have formal you can have formal experiment on stage, right? I mean, the, the spectacle can take two hours or five hours, but it's still going to be on stage, and you're still going to need to take a ticket. And this apparatus, and so I think places like the Walker Center or MoCA, wind up actually being incredibly necessary and radical because they let you ask this really basic question that, that you can't always, ask, that, you, that you really can't ask in a theater because it's committed to an architecture of proscenia, whether it's site specific or not, you're always fundamentally having this theatrical experience and that makes it very difficult to experiment, but in spaces, you know, at MoCA we used, 
we used their big theater and we just cleared out every single thing in it, so it became this huge box. And if you bought a ticket to Mocha, you could go into the, you could, you could experience that theatrical space as, a, as an extra gallery in the museum, which changed the entire way that you would look at it. But you have to have opportunities like that because otherwise this communication doesn't happen. Um, but there are, I mean, but there are turf wars. There are little turf wars in both directions. I mean, in terms of, you know, you, you know, theater people are going to be like, ah, what the fuck do you think you're doing? And I'm waltzing in here, you know, and then, <laughs> and then our people are like, well, you, you come from the theater. What? Um, I just want to say one quick last thing is that I think a lot of it has to do, if you look at just in terms of markets, and again, I'm not talking about getting paid or monetizing anything, but the luxury goods sector, and, you know, uh, Gordon and I wrote a lot about this a long time ago, like the luxury goods sector, if you look at where the grants are or where the fellowships or the big prizes are in visual arts, they're generally funded by, like, they were funded by Altoids or Hugo Boss or, you know, Prada has a foundation. You know, like, they have an interest, these brands have an interest in maintaining the highest possible, most radical profile. Like, they're going to promote kind of restless, really cutting edge works. Theater, uh, dance, opera, they're funded by banks. They're funded by banks and they're funded by airlines. I mean, the grants come from, that, but, but the point is they're funded by, they're funded by things that are, have, a, have a basic, they're populist in a way. They're not luxury brands. And they can't create a cutting edge, they can't create a cutting edge kind of profile. They're inher the funding sources are inherently conservative. And that actually prevents this kind of restless forward motion in a way that visual arts is funded by when it's funded a totally different set of brands that really want you to like, you know, take a chainsaw to something on stage. So I think that, there are these really tiny things that really, that really have make an enormous difference in the culture. So. Well, I think the culture, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, go ahead. Because yeah, I was going to move to another a point that I thought maybe wasn't touched on that might be yeah. worth, uh, you know, Andy, you brought up in your essay, and I, like, the, the quite distinctly different approaches that people, curators from different camps view work in and uh, you know I, I, I sent your essay around to all the visual art curators at the Walker you know and um, it was interesting because one of the responses I got, I got back was a good friend and colleague was um, he, he had sent back and said I have a complete disinterest in many of the values that underpin most performing artists i.e. conditioning viewers to experience in, within a confined space a specific to, aimed at a specific end um, including the appreciation of the craft that we've been conditioned into in the space to appre appreciate. And so that sense uh, that you brought up of people feeling manipulated or um, sort of driven to a certain kind of response, unlike, say, in a gallery setting where people can come and go as they please and have whatever kind of response you know, they may want. That I don't think was entirely accurate in the moment we're living in right now, which I think is really exciting, especially at this time with COIL and Under the Radar and American Realness and all the things going on in New York. I do think that some of those structures are starting to break down. The bulk of the performing arts field is built on selling tickets, a certain theater, filling a kind of space in a certain kind of way. But certainly European festivals have led away, and I think more and more we're seeing, Claudia LaRocca wrote about it, more and more festivals starting to spring up throughout the U.S that are really after breaking apart the frame in some way. And so I'm hoping that, that those trends will continue. If you wander through the resource room at the Association for Performing Arts Presenters, you won't have any real sense of that uh, because it's, that's about sort of a certain uh, traditional model of, of kind of buying, touring artwork. But I think there's more and more um, little opportunities for, for that frame to be broken apart. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think well, I was, I can't, why can't I remember bodies in urban spaces? Uh, I thought that was, you know, he was making, did you, yeah. it was in Philly Live Arts, I can't remember his name um, right now. But he was Willie making, Dorner? Willie Dorner, yeah. he was making these sculptural installations out of bodies in urban spaces. You didn't have to really pay to go see it, you could just follow it around the city. It was really cool. They did it here last summer, and it was in Philly. So, I mean, that's just one thing that sort of pops to mind about, there's also site-based work, which is sort of breaking down the model of, you know, transaction and yeah. place. Um, I, but I, I, you know, to, I feel like there's actually some overlap between what you're talking about and what David's talking yeah. about, because yeah. there's this cultural issue, which is, which is process-based, which is that I feel like performing arts is more collaborative in the way it's built, necessarily, than visual arts. Um, even probably the, uh, Rosalie touched on this, even the most sort of dictatorial 
choreographer or theater director still on some, they're reliant on, on actors and on collaborators to build, whereas a visual artist is going to, you know, we had that whole outsourcing thing, so you have, you know, um, uh, Koontz or, you know, these people who hire other people to make their work. Um, but that's, yeah. a, that's a contractual distinction. I mean, if I, you know, if I, if I hire an actor in, if I, if I make a project that's funded by a theater, right, right. then that actor has to get credit because his union dictates it, right? right? If I use an actor in a project funded by visual arts, he's just a fabricator, the same way, I mean, the same way the guys who, and he doesn't get any credit at all. But that, but that, but that is really this weird contractual. I mean, the, the work is not. It's not like. It's not like. Oh, visual arts is this outsourcing thing. I mean, it's not. It's actually just. No, but it's I, actually, I, I'm really Anna, Anna has. Yeah. 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 yeah no, go ahead. Because actually, we are mainly talking about festivals, and mm -hmm. what I think it's an interesting thing, and that's also my experience of how they are performing performance art in art institutions. Because are you presenting it as a form of a festival, so it's a event that has its like, time frame, it happens, and then it's over? Or you find another format more closer to the exhibitions? Because I'm, I'm at the moment working at, at MoMA, the performance department, and I just started six, mo six months ago. So it's like I started having realized any project, but from my previous experience, when I was working at the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw, but they're completely different scales, so it's much more elastic, like the timeline, and much more like uh, flexible, and so on. We realized that this, and now I'm back, I'm like going to Europe, but this, I think, very important performance exhibition, performance project called Living Currency of Pierre Paul Blanc. And maybe some of you are familiar, Fleur Bishop wrote about that. It's actually, it's a, Pierre Paul Blanc is a French curator, and it's a, a project that started in 2005, where he takes, I mean, try to make it short because it can really be long, and he takes like a Pierre Bouglowski, the Living Currency, which hasn't been translated in English, it's one on any wrong, so like a theoretical framework. If you consider like what the role of the body, like the body as a, as a value exchange in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the global economy. And he is like working with uh, artists as Santiago Serra, as Sanya Vekovic, as uh, Prince and Dolan, as uh, Teresa Margolis, as many artists actually, where a lot of things, a lot of objects had France West, uh, France of Edel Walter, so many objects that have to be somehow activated. The body is the center of the, of the, of the performance of the project, but not as the body art of the 60s and 70s. So when we invited him to come to Warsaw, the museum, it's a temporary space, it's an ex furniture shop, and then Pierre said, let's do something in the theater. Let's use the theater stage. I always wanted to use the theater stage. I always wanted somehow to question all the mechanism that exists in the theater and all this hierarchical structure. So we approached the Dramatical Theater in Warsaw, which is a very Italian scene, and there like, they had a very classical repertoire. And also to mention that in Poland with Rotowski Cantor, like theater, it's a really something saying that you are not really allowed to touch. So it was very difficult also to explain what are we are going to do, that those are actors, that it will be a three days exhibition on the stage from two to seven every day and if you are calling it exhibition, there will be different actors, and here it's also this idea of what is performance today, because there were very many, many work that we needed to hire other people, like the Santiago Serra work with the 110 construction done by 10 workers, so you have to hire 10 workers. To put it. <coughs> what we call, like, as a small institution, as a very, like, born, new, newborn institution, we were really faced with the, how you produce performance today, so what, what are like, the, all the economical conditions for this performance. And so it was really tough. It was really tough in many sense because it was all this name shaping. There was this Teresa Margolis piece when there is actually uh, the bubbles with the, the water of the dead bodies, like with, with from Mexico. So the technician from the theater didn't, when he knew what was about, he didn't want to, to work on it. So it was like hard to take convincing someone to do it, to put it in, and we did it. And it was, I think it was really great. There was also the, the part of the music first time to use with, with La Montellan, Cornelia Cardins, Cornelia Cardins, and so on. And the, the, the public was entering from the backstage. So the, the seats were used at the time of the landscape. So they can really walk around the, on, the, on the stage. Can you, can you actually maybe scan and yeah, direct sorry, out? Yeah, yeah, because I'm, yeah, I'm talking, yeah, sorry. 
sorry, yeah, sorry. So, so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, so actually, uh, so the public was circulating, and the the, the different works. Here, wait, hold on. Let me just back up and explain what you. This is Anna Janewski. She's currently the associate curator of performance at MoMA, and she was previously at. Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. MoMA in Warsaw. And she's talking about uh, an exhibit, the living, uh, the living Currency exhibit that they did there. On, where, the, on the theater stage. On the theater stage there, because they had some artists that, they, they had a temporary gallery there, and they saw that there was a theater, so they went to the official state theater and worked with them. So she's talking about that experience yeah. and about um, the challenges of learning about producing performance coming from the visual art context. In the theater context. And like to, to make it very shortly, it was a total clash. In the sense that the performance, like the, the three days were great. Afterward, there were the Berlin Biennial, like a few months after that. But nobody wanted to write about that because it wasn't not theater, it was not performance. So I, I was receiving SMS, is the most touching, is the most beautiful I ever think I've ever seen. And just uh, the question, maybe someone of you are familiar with Tanya Bruguera's piece, The Tatlin Whisper, when, the, when the, actually the policeman is coming at the Tate Gallery with the white horse. And this was part of the living currency done at the Tate. So it's, it's, a, quiet, it's a project that has been shown four times. So to come back, nobody wanted to write about that. But what the only, like the only writing was a critique from the dramaturg of the, of the theater saying that the museum wanted to criticize the theater. It was very, very long. <laughs> absolutely not taking into consideration any of the works that have been shown. It actually were questioning many things of all the theater, but also the art. And this is this idea of the context of also the institutional critique present in the, in the, in the contemporary art. And so it was this really this clash of the theater and visual art, and it was like a fight, almost. Then the curator was answering, then she was answering, then I was answering, then we translated Claire Bishop text about performativity and outsourcing when she's mentioning the living currency. And so it was closed, but it was like five articles of like attacking. We tried to discuss, but then the end it was like attacking each other. Mm -hmm. So this like it's interesting because then it's like from the other context, but it's very similar, this like sometimes impossibility to to communicate and to accept like the, 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 the different approach, also the stretching these boundaries yeah. of the, also the time and space. And for me, this is also I wanted to ask you how, because I think this is something we are also facing, well, in a way, anyway, in art institutions, how then you present life art? Because it's not just like, in, we are talking about festivals, it happens. And one of the great examples of the performance this year, and Claire is mentioning in the, in the article, is Musée de la Danse of mm -hmm. Boris Charmatz, which actually he succeeded in crossing those different disciplines from dance to visual art, even philosophers, expanding into three days to create also this involvement, famous involvement of the audience, which is not, nothing to do with like relational aesthetics and so on. So this would be like really my, Curious to know how you're dealing, like how you are asking yourself when you're saying, okay, so I know that you're working a lot with performing art, and in Europe we don't have such a distinction that yeah. it's also something that then it's making this conflict even more uh, str stronger. In well, we did um, five years ago, we, or six years ago, we opened a, actually a sort of formal theater, which seems a little odd, um, but it's an intentionally fairly flexible space that can be used in lots of different ways and things. But we have a, <laughs> a season of work that actually does follow quite traditional models of selling tickets and having people come. But we also, by part of our mandate and strategic plan, you know, are really, tr as many times as possible, trying to break apart the, f the frame, trying to create work in new ways and have the audience perform a relationship just be di very different. Um, um, uh, so uh, whenever we can, we look at like, how can the space be turned out, turned around? How can we work still site specifically? How can we we support? Although it's not easy, a one-on-one -on -one performance piece. We did remedy protocols, call cut in a box the year before last. You know, and it, it it is true that most models of performing arts aren't set up budgetarily and logistically to support a one. -on, you know, works that are are have quite a different relationship to 
um, to the experience of go, going to the theater. But I think it's, uh, there's all these contemporary art centers and co people really looking to support ways that, to do that differently right now. And I think MoMA, and in, in New York, one of the really exciting directions is there's so many uh, museums that are really looking at those questions and I think are bringing n new thinking around <coughs> it. Um, uh, I feel like I'm really lucky because a lot of colleagues I had at, at the Walker are now in different places, uh, you know, around at PS1, Peter Ely, and, you know, and, and Philippe Verne at DIA, and, and Kathy, and, and Dorian, uh, you know, at, at MoMA, and different people. Um, but, but I've seen almost every museum that, that in any way has a contemporary art um, uh, perspective looking at ways to, to, find, to figure out how performance can work within those, those contexts. To, to sort of build on, yeah. or to open up a slightly different yeah. channel of question, and we're sort of tough on time, but I'm really interested in, um, because you talked about uh, the Living Currency exhibit, and I'm thinking um, of Judy Hussey Taylor at Dance Space, yeah. who has this platform model that she's doing, and you know we're we're seeing this idea in in dance more so, you know, dance that I think is coming from the visual art world of actually like ideas based themed exhibits where artists or curators are being invited to explore ideas. Um, much less so in performing arts. And so I guess my question is, is there um, the possibility or a reason to sort of look at, I mean, because I think artists are like scientists, sort of explorers, and we like to put them into dialogue with ideas. Is there, an, uh, A, is there a reason for an idea, ideas-based investigative model for building performing arts projects, um, and if so, what would sort of be the curator, like what sort of curatorial dialogues do we have to have, uh, both in as we're training new performing arts curators and visual arts curators and trying to engender dialogue? It's an unfocused question, but I just... Well, you know, you mentioned, you asked a question. There's a program that started uh, uh, up at Wesleyan last year called the Institute for Curatorial Practice and Performance, L looking at exactly at, at the questions around can there be deeper training for performing art professionals who may um, not have had rich academic training around cura art history or curatorial practice, but ways to instill um, ways that visual art curators naturally are trained to, to grapple with ideas and apply them to an, uh, the formation of an exhibition. Or, and, and so Judy is on the faculty, Judy Hussey-Taylor from Dance Space. She's been doing some wonderful work around creating platforms and small catalogs. And I think more and more, um, especially younger curators and the students in this ICPP <coughs> class are really being asked to think about their projects coming from a point of view and grappling with ideas and then applying the, the, the content within that structure. Um, but it's not as, it's not, there's not as rich or as long a history at all in the performing arts of thinking that way. Certainly there's festivals that are thematically based, there's threads of programs, there's, there's some great examples in different parts of the country, um, but, but I think it's, it's, a, it's now um, a, a developing tr a trend that people are really interested in looking at more seriously. workshops and, and discussions about curating. And now there is this performative... Point your, point your comments there. <laughs> there is this performative um, moment. I, uh, the ICI uh, has, uh, has been uh, organized, has organized this like curating performance. <coughs> and I know that NYU, so it's something that is starting to, to be discussed also because of the presence of the performance of the live art in the art institutions. So there is this moment that a lot, I, and this is what you're saying at the beginning of your article, that a lot of people involved in visual arts with performance and performing art doesn't have any really background in the... So you've yeah. got to start up. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Terry? Oh, I, just wanted, I wanted to say another observation in all of this that I'm hearing, and maybe we can zoom out a little bit, to just kind of have a look at the kind of real provincialism in this discussion. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, which is around the privileging of self-proclaimed radicalization <laughs> as more important than other investigations. And also the hybridity of forms being uh, assessed through their visual um, kind of uh, juxtaposition as opposed to myself, many of my colleagues, where that is in a swim inside our practice without trying to make it visible as an imprimatur of some really provincial discussion such as this. But it's starting to come up with some statements about what we can do, you know, no reality, all these things. We have to go to a post-opinion place to really become avant-garde, to say all usages in relief in juxtaposition are completely valid. And we're still in this place of looking for the new, which is a banality and it's an anachronism. And it is some, and that might be a provocation people could get mad, but I see it in a lot of artists. You can look at the, the website for Under the Radar. The biggest thing on there is looking the big the new big thing. And I'm like, is it a dishwashing? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't set out to be an artist to do the next big thing. And in terms of educating people further about all these discussions, if there is this obstacle of the commodification of radicalization as part of the education, you will not be able to see the fullness of practices that are out there and what could become a really burgeoning new way of looking at things. And it will ultimately have to do with seeing a range of usages. Saying things like, you know, 70% of theater, whatever you're talking about, these, these ideas that your, your work is predicated on a comment about theater, I'm like, yeah, I, there's a lot of work like that, but you can go see something like Orange County, Osage, Orange County, that beautiful, 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 fiery piece of work that was inside of a very conventional theatrical place. So if we have this kind of imprimatur of provocation as our value system, there's a whole bunch of stuff that gets missed. Well, um, I, I actually don't understand what I mean. I mean what do you mean Everyone here who said, Philip's colleague said, I can't, whatever it was, I can't see these things that are, whatever you said. You say in your article, you know, psychological realism, no, that's out. Based on, our, who's the oracle here? First, wait, wait. You, you, you can argue these things, but it's, it's in this no. discussion. It's in this I, I, I don't, Terry, I love, I don't. Also, also, also. If I if I say that if I say that you know I can't if I say that I, that you know seventy percent of it you know is the same, that's just that's just me. I mean, given it wait 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 given it given a choice, I would sooner go see August Osage County than I would go to see like a self-proclaimed radical piece of theater. Mainly because I think that's all theaters are actually that that architecture is actually good for. But I think the only time radicalism ever came up in this discussion. Was about was about actually frustration with the formal constraints of the first institution you start to work with. I don't think anyone was really yeah, valorizing. This discussion probably it's also in the article and some. And I mean, I, I, I you know, I'm just hearing a bunch of kind of categorical statements. You say something about psychological theater evincing an effect, and I'm like, well, so does all these other things. Everyone. I, I have to go do this, but I mean, my point is just that personally, I find psychological realism coming from that and my background. It's like you know, I as a creative person, I no longer find that a satisfying right. form. So I'm not making a categorical definition that it sucks. What's, what's an accumulated idea? This thing is not the final answer. Is to look at where our opinion resides and the importance of our criticality. I don't think it's important. I don't. For me, I'm not going to work and saying, does this replicate my opinion? Um, and I myself am not looking to do work. I've done a work right now that I was really surprised about where it ended up. But if I was saying, if I was in this good bad part of paradigm, saying like that's not good, that's not radical, that's not this, that's reality, that's artifice, I couldn't make anything, you know. So I'm making these works that just fall out of me in a way that's not about representing my opinion. This a kind of progressive countercultural stance. It's a breeze but to no make that. No one's saying that we that we're not working. It's just that well, we're in a conversation I, I, and we're not, not showing the work. Right. Right. But, but I think you're also misunderstanding the conversation about the reality effect, and and we're also having a conversation about um, this this idea that the space of of the art gallery is neutral is, or um, these ideas about um, the um, perf performance art standing for authenticity 
and, and a real performance in opposition to theater, that's an, it's an old divide. And so all we were, all, what, what came up was it's time to, to get over that because it's just a performance of reality yeah. or neutrality. I would actually, so, I, would I, so I, think, kind of, uh, I would actually encourage you to come back next week for the citizen criticism discussion because what I really want to talk about, huh? Okay. But I really want to talk about actually what we were talking about, which is like the critical stance, which I think as we enter into this sort of new, <coughs> new period of discourse and structures and the way we relate to performance, I mean, I really, I, I'm a little, I'm trying to be cool, but it's like I really built what I do at CultureBot and what Jeremy does and what we do not to replicate the critical stance of the New York Times, but to create dialogue and, and to be a discussant. So it's like I so it, the, the 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 personal experience I'm, is always there. So I, I actually agree with you. Like we have to sort of move beyond yeah, this dialogue. Yeah, this point. It's not about you or against anyone, but it's in this room. It's in this place. Yeah. Terry, I totally don't know what you're talking about. I mean, what nonsense that this is a professional conversation. I mean, I wanted to say provincial. I'm getting the wrong word. It's not remote or provincial. Everybody here is supremely sophisticated, included in the audience. Everybody here is working very hard to break all those texts, to break all those institutions. The form is totally set up to look, be, be, to look to the old, to the new, to uh, we, you know, support all kinds of generations, to support artists whose work gets only better and better by the time they get to 90. Nobody, you know, this idea that we're all sitting here going, oh, we only want the new. It's just, I mean, this is talking about directing theater. This is just not true. Everybody on this floor represents such a search for really uh, not authentic uh, re realism, to really investigate what are we looking at. Um, and yeah, no, I don't disagree with that. No, so I'm just saying, you know, I'm be careful with using words like this is a provincial. I mean, we're meant to sit here and go, we're provincial. Are, it's we're ridiculous. talking about certain things here that I think we could, we could zoom out and see bigger. Absolutely, yeah. but there's a lot going on here. The last word you can apply to anyone in this room, and I see everybody here too, is provincial. These are some of the, the biggest movers and shakers who are trying to make this city. Uh, okay, so I, we're, we're running out of time. I, I see a couple of hands that I want to address. Um, I think this is an important dialogue. I will try and figure out how we can t continue it uh, in virtual space, if not in real space. This young lady. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of in agreement, actually, in relation to, I think there's been a deferral to a binary opposition between art and theatre. And I think that most of us in the room are here because we don't believe in that. And yet we were asked to stand up as theatre people or visual arts people. There are dance people here, but also there are people who work between architecture and dance, and visual arts and media. And I think most of us here don't represent those. That's why we're here for that dialogue, really. So I, I'm sort of in agreement that, you know, that I think there was something more than, than talking about... In a way, what you were talking about is what we know. Do you know what I mean? It's, but for me, what's come up, really, is how do you talk to uh, the critics and the reviewers and the institutions and also, you know, audiences? I, I don't think it's going on this conversation for a bit. One thing we all were trying to do is, I mean, I think we all want the same thing. Everyone, everyone feels like they're sitting between disciplines and they're just ba basically making some kind of progressive, you know, <coughs> output. Um, but that they're continually stymied by sort of enormous institutional divides which exist outside of this room. And I think, I mean, if we, I mean, Rosalie's point about audiences or, you know, Liz talking about actually facing down a black box. I mean, this is, I mean, what we're actually talking about is, you know, or, or you know, what happens when a visual artist winds up directing. We all want the same thing, but what we're actually trying to address is the fact that there really are huge firewalls that force whatever we make into one thing or the other, and we're frustrated by that. And yeah, we've all experienced it, but I think what, what, what we've been trying to address is let's accept the facts and try to think about the facts in the most analytic way possible and figure out how to, how to actually break them down. It's not, it's, not that, it's not that any of us are embracing this opposition. It's like we're saying that the opposition exists outside these walls, and we're trying to figure out what to do about it. And it's funny that you were, that Terry brought up this issue of the new, and then the complaint is that we didn't succeed in bringing up the new answer. I mean, we're kind of we're here as somewhat, I guess, expert witnesses, but I don't think anyone's proclaiming to have the answer. We're going through the conversation and and going through the frustrations with the contextual frameworks that we're working in and how, 
how it could shift in some way, but I, I don't think I have the one singular answer to that. I think we're, I think we're, I think we're, I, I think in some ways we are articulating things that we already have know and experience, but I think that, you know, that uh, I'm really, um, excited and pleased that we have sort of uh, 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 everybody here at the table of varying experiences who are in that middle place. And yes, I'm sure that as this is a professional performance conference and we 